Resuming debate, reprise de débat, l'honorable député, the honorable member for Edmonton Strathcona. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, key among the considerations lying at the center of the debate on Bill C-14, physician-assisted dying, is the ruling made in February 2015 by the Supreme Court of Canada in the Carter case, striking down sections of the criminal code that prohibit the provision of assistance in dying on the grounds that they are unconstitutional as they violate parts of Article 7 of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms and that everyone has the right of life, liberty and security of the person. The court ruled that the criminal code provisions are of no force or effect to the effect that they prohibit physician-assisted death for a competent adult person who clearly consents to the termination of life and has a grievous and remedial, irremedial medical condition, including an illness, disease or disability, that causes enduring suffering that is intolerable to the individual in the circumstances of his or her condition. The court then suspended the declaration of invalidity for a year and in turn granting to the current federal government an additional four months to June 6 of this year, after which the criminal code offences become null and void. Clearly, Madam Speaker, action is necessary to uphold our constitutional and charter rights. Secondly, it's important to give consideration to the recommendations by the All-Party Special Joint Committee on Physician-Assisted Dying, struck by this government and mandated to review the report on the external panel and options for a legislative response established by the former Conservative government, and to make recommendations on the framework of a federal response that would respect the Constitution, the Charter, and Canadian priorities. The committee recommendations are based on the testimony from a wide diversity of witnesses and review of parallel legislation enacted in other jurisdictions, including Quebec. The committee considered a great many critical issues, including should there be a condition based on age? How will the law protect the vulnerable? Should the law recognize advanced medical directives? Should the law impose waiting periods? Should the law enable conscience objections by health providers? What is the correct terminology to apply? What are the respective jurisdictions of federal and provincial authorities? How do we ensure equal access to these medical services? And the need to expand access to palliative care including on the NDP call for a national strategy. The challenge before us, Madam Speaker, is to determine whether Bill C-10 clearly and properly addresses these matters. Madam Speaker, this is a highly personal and emotional topic for all members in this place and frankly all Canadians facing life and death decisions. Members of my own immediate family struggled in their last days. My younger sister suffered a painful extended period prior to her death, even where some palliative care was available. My older sister suffered a lesser quality of existence for far too many years because the only accommodation for younger, chronically ill patients was an extended care facility for seniors. Our governments must deliver on promises for expanded palliative care for all and housing for the chronically ill and disabled. This access is surely also a charter right. I have carefully considered the letters and conversations with my constituents who have expressed a wide range of views and perspectives on the matter of medically assistance, assisted dying. What I have found discouraging, Madam Speaker, is the lack of full understanding by many I have spoken with and the misinformation being provided to them about the implications of the Supreme Court decision, and in particular, those who have expressed opposition to the enactment of a law on providing medical assistance to the dying. I hosted a meeting in my constituency with my colleague MP for Victoria, the co-chair of the Special Joint Committee, to provide an opportunity to understand the background to Bill C-14, including the ruling by the Supreme Court, the report of the Special Joint Committee and the table bill. I have been deeply impacted in my views by meeting with a constituent suffering deeply with a fast-paced diagnosis of ALS already unable to speak and desperately hoping to be able to gain assistance in his death when he determines is the right time for passing. I've heard from constituents concerned that the bill reduces the rights of Canadians to choose an assisted death, while others express concern the bill will increase risks to the disabled. I must share that by far the majority of views expressed to me, including at my public forum, have expressed concern that the bill does not go far enough in upholding the directions by the Supreme Court to uphold Canadians' constitutional and charter rights. 
Well, how well does Bill C-10 address these key needs and concerns? The bill does set forth a basic framework for decriminalizing medically assisted deaths, including right of access. However, instead of following the recommendations of the all-party joint committee to adopt the clear and precise terms set forth by the Supreme Court to determine access to medically assisted death, this bill adds further onerous and frankly nonsensical qualifiers. Most notably is the requirement that their natural death has become reasonable foreseeable. Surely that is the case for every human being on this earth. The Carter family, who were the subject of the Supreme Court ruling, has spoken out strongly against these added criteria. Worse, Madam Speaker, it's the opinion expressed by numerous legal experts that these additional criteria lack legal certainty and will inevitably force already suffering patients and their families to return to the courts or to travel overseas or to kill themselves. None of these options present a compassionate alternative nor uphold our constitutional and charter rights. I would like to share briefly some of the words of a constituent sent to me. In quotes, 19 years ago, I watched my 87-year-old mother spend three weeks in severe pain as cancer ate her alive, begging to be put out of misery. The proposed law of medically assisted dying is 19 years too late, but at least it will spare others in similar condition. Unfortunately, it doesn't cover those whose death is not imminent, but who have medical conditions that are causing them intolerable suffering that must be rectified before this law is passed. A second widespread concern expressed to me is the failure of Bill C-10 to provide for advanced directives. I'm aware from my discussions with Alberta officials that this is a matter of grave concern to Albertans, many of whom have er erroneously of the belief that their personal directives cover medical intervention. Many of my constituents have asked me to demand this right be extended. And again, I quote from a constituent letter. In quotes, I would like to have the ability to have an advanced directive that would stipulate the conditions under which I would want to have my life ended. At the point I would want assisted death, I may not have the mental or physical capacity to restate my wishes. If this bill passes without the proposed amendments, my only option will be to go to the River Valley, some minus 30 night and freeze to death. This, of course, will create st stress in my family, the community and police as they search for my body. Others have expressed concern that the law fails to prohibit hospitals or other institutions from denying their access to medically assisted death on the grounds of religious beliefs. While they accept that individual medical practitioners should be extended that right, they strongly believe that there should be a duty to refer to another practitioner and preferably for the delivery of services within the same institution. This would be the compassionate decision given the dire state of many making this request. While the Special Joint Committee agreed to a waiting period between the request and delivery of the services, many have expressed concern that Bill C-10 requires an across-the-board 15-day wait period. Much more preferable would be a waiting period as determined by the medical practitioner based on the circumstances of each case. I can speak from personal experience that to require a suffering sibling to hang on with severe pain for more than two weeks after making the decision to let go is nothing less than cruel and unusual punishment and surely offends one's charter rights. The bill does provide protections to practitioners and afford protections for the disabled. What it fails to do is extend clear rights to Canadians to determine their own fate within reasonable parameters. Equally disappointing is the failure of this government to include in its budget the promised dollars for palliative care available to all Canadians. I will vote for this bill at second reading to be considered by committee but I implore the government to ensure our concerns, the concerns expressed by our cons constituents, by all Canadians, be considered by the committee who are undertaking simultaneous review and to give fair and full consideration to any recommended amendments. Thank you. Uh, oh, excuse me, pardon Question, uh, Questions and comments, questions and comments. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Leader of the government Robert of the House of Commons. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. And um, the, the member ended her comments talking about the, the palliative care and asking the government to make a commitment towards it. And I think that it's, it is important to, for us to, to reinforce at times that there is a very substantial commitment that has been made in terms of the future of palliative care. And contrary to what the Conservatives might say, it actually is in the budget. Uh, all one needs to do is, is to read it, and if you've lost your copy, I'm more than happy to provide you a copy of it. Uh, Ms. Madam Speaker, my question 
question is related to the fact that uh, we have a Minister of Health who has made a commitment to work with our provincial stakeholders and others in order to try to develop that cross-Canada palliative care uh, program. And I'm asking for the member to provide comment. Would she not agree that the, the government has an obligation to work with the different provinces that administer uh, health care, whether it's the, the palliative care, the uh, home care services, uh, independent living, and so forth, that there's a need for the federal government to work with Ottawa, and then that's, I mean, with the provinces. And that's, in fact, what we're witnessing uh, today. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Strathcona. Yes, Madam Speaker, I'd like to thank the Honourable Member for his question. And in fact, it gives me an opportunity to raise this issue. The federal government does not have to confer with the provinces and territories in those areas where it is directly responsible for medical services to our military, to our First Nation peoples, our Métis and Inuit. And so how about starting with delivery of the requirements of the federal government to provide access for palliative care to all those who are, they are responsible for? And comments, questions, et commentaires. The honourable member for uh, Kitchener Conestoga. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And just to follow up on the palliative care uh, question, first of all, as it relates to the budget, whether or not it's mentioned in the budget, I would just uh, ask my colleague to just give me the page number, and I'll glad to look it up for him myself. I can point it out in the platform where it was clearly indicated that immediately they would invest $3 billion in palliative care, but I don't see it in the budget, Madam Speaker. But more importantly, I wonder if my colleague would agree that in the legislation we could insert an amendment that would require that all those who are requesting physician-assisted suicide, that it be mandatory that they at least have a palliative care consultation before they proceed with the physician-assisted suicide. <laughs> A member for Edmonton Strathcona. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and through you to the member. Well, I'm sorry, no, I would not agree to that requirement because we know what is it less than 15% of Canadians even have access to palliative care. So essentially, that would be a means of denying access to assisted uh, medical uh, assistance to all Canadians. Um, even in the case where my own sister had access to palliative care. Um, there were many aspects, for example, she had no access to a psychologist or a sociologist, although a social worker that was available in the cancer clinic, but because they weren't doing direct medical intervention, they kicked her out of the cancer clinic. Even with palliative care, she was suffering unendurable pain. Pain is a very personal experience. And so even where there were wonderful doctors and there were wonderful caregivers, she was in such extreme pain, she could not be touched. So. I do not agree with that as a condition. Nonetheless, I do agree there is an obligation on the government, and wouldn't have been nice if the previous Conservative government had in fact funded palliative care. 